So today's lesson, we're going to look at MICC cable, mineral insulator, uh, copper covered or copper cladded cable, depends on how you want to say it. However, we should have watched the three videos that aren't public at the moment on YouTube, which was me looking at the tools, looking how to make an end off, and then looking how to test a mineral insulator cable, which I put in the group chat for my learners. If you're watching this from afar, I just want to clear up some things for you. It's the hottest day of the year so far in uh, the end, it's the 31st of May. So I've got a couple of learners with me. I stopped working for Tresham uh, uh, first week in April. The two guys that are with me today are giving up their free time um, to do this lesson. I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart and they've joined me out of the goodness of their heart. So if at any point they pick up a beverage that isn't water-based and start drinking it, it's not an issue because this is effectively a little bit of fun for us on a Sunday. So I've had a few people message in saying, oh, the students are drinking or the rest of it. Yeah, I would be. I ain't got a cold one in the fridge. So here we go then. So we're going to try and just recap really quickly. Uh, the stuff that you should have ascertained from the videos that you've already seen, YouTube will get them when we come out of lockdown and uh, Mineral Insulator will be more effective when we're looking at it in from a college point of view. John, often Mineral Insulated cable comes just bare copper. So that's just the outside of the cable is bare copper. And obviously yeah. we've got our conductors in there, two core, and it's impregnated with a white powder. We'll come back to that in a minute. However, we can cover this in PVC over sheathing. Can you remember any of the colours from the videos you watched? Yeah, so red. Um, so we've got red, white. yes. White, yeah. yes. White. white. And white. one more. Orange or yellow. Orange. orange. Yeah, yeah, orange. Now, because we're in lockdown, I can't find my white sheath one. Can we use our imagination and imagine a third one was there? White, yeah. of course we can. So... Obviously, it must be a reason we've got different ones. So bear am I. OK, that's fine. And then we can identify it with a coloured sheath. Can you think, Gramos, why I would have red sheathed cable? What would it be identifying circuit wise? What type of circuit might have a red sheath cable to it? I'm not even there now. OK, John? Uh, fire alarms. Yeah, fire alarms. So it's one of them and you think, oh, dear, kick yourself. Sorry, it's got uh, it's right in the first couple of minutes. So everyone will know you've. Buff, buff that one up, yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, so, we've got, so four alarm circuits with red. Okay, identify with red. What about white, John? Do you remember what the white one was for? Is it emergency lighting? Yeah, it was. So emergency lighting's white. It can be chosen because it's athletically pleasing in an office area or something like that where the walls are either white or magnolia. But we're thinking about from exam point of view, white covered mineral insulated or other fire resistive cables we'll look at in later in, not in this video, but later in our notes. Um, can be white. What about orange? Uh, Why orange? orange indicates electricity circuits brilliant because if we saw a blue pipe what would be in it uh, gas no yeah. water water a yellow pipe uh, gas and if uh, you saw an orange ducting you'd know that potentially what was in it uh, electric cables good purple Oh, data. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Brilliant, John. So, yeah, so so that's what we've got, though. So it's an exam aimed for 16 plus. Can we identify the cable's uh, use from the actual sheath colour? So orange is general use for electrical. So we used to have a lot of orange MI cable when we were back in Welling, but we're not there anymore. So then we said about the actual, um, so you can see in there, the conductors. So we've got the conductors there, uh, two core. So which conductor, John, is glaringly not inside the cable if we've only got two conductors? Uh, CPC. Yeah, and we're going to be using this great big thick lump of outside copper, which is huge probably compared to the conductors in here, as our CPC. OK, so this cable system is brilliant because it will give you a really large cross-sectional area CPC. Yeah. The conductors themselves, what is their construction like? So describe the their construction. Uh, construction. I'm trying to uh, get you. So if we look here. I've only got what I've got in the garage again. Describe their construction to me. This is a, a one mil mineral insulated. So what are they like? Oh, yeah. So it's a solid strand, isn't it? Yeah, just one solid copper. So no stranded. All the conductors yeah. are solid. So, so we know, don't we, that when we get to four mil in twin and CPC cable and six mil, etc., that we start going towards. Have I got any here? No, I haven't. We start going towards solid stranded. In mineral insulated cables, they're always a solid conductor. OK, and they can go up to 150 millimetres squared in heavy gauge variety. The light gauge, which we would have used in the workshop and I did in my video, and that's where the L came from, that goes up to a maximum cross-sectional area of 10 millimetres squared. So it's the, it's the thickness of the outside of the cables, the copper, that makes it between light and heavy gauge. So all the conductors are now solid. They're impregnated in there within a white powder. Grandma, you didn't see the video. So, John, do you know what that white powder is called? 
It's not French chalk, is it? You're right, it isn't. No, and it's the next one. Magnesium oxide. Oh, he's got it. Go on, John. Yeah, go on, John. Yeah, magnesium oxide. And that is a fantastic insulator, but is prone when what enters the end of it, John? Um, Water. Yeah, moisture. And at the moment, moisture is entering the end of this conductor here. Okay, and it will saturate down and stop. I'm going to get it wrong. Somebody, I think it's about 85 mil. It can no longer draw moisture down to it. So as long as we make the end off longer than that length, so longer that length, we'll actually remove the fact that it might have drawn down some moisture. And in the video, you see when I was testing my cable that it looked as if I had a low reading. When I cut the other end off, removing the moisture that was in there, our insulation resistance test shot up. So it's magnesium oxide. It's hygroscopic. It means it draws moisture from the air and the ends need sealing. Yep. OK, and our conductors in there are copper solid. The outside or melting point of copper, I should say. So the melting point of copper is around about a thousand degrees C. The melting point of magnesium is about 800 degrees C. So we can see that this is a fantastically flame retardant cable. The actual copper sheath on it is solid drawn. So there's no little weld in there like our conduit and our seam weld. It's this solid drawn wiring system. It's also waterproof. So believe it or not, even though we said the ends can absorb moisture, you could chuck this in a pond. Each end coming out the other end, so each of the ends, not obviously submersed, this, this would be impenetrable to water. People are like, well, we can't put it near water, it's hygroscopic. Well, it's solid drawn, it's fine, so you can chuck it in water. But we've got to be careful of drawing moisture into the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. The actual cable itself might be anywhere between 800 and 1,000 degrees, but what do we tend to put on the end of, say, a fire alarm system? What would the, the MI cable be connecting to? On a fire alarm system, give me some examples of the ends of the MI cable we connected to. Uh, uh, break glass. Yeah, and what's pre the pre predominant material of a break glass made up of, John? Uh, glass. And? Uh, steel. It isn't. Is it not? Oh, well, no. Aluminium. Maybe you would not. think so, but it isn't. Um, no, I don't know for that one. Plastic. Uh, so plastic enclosure with a break glass on it. Yeah. So we've seen loads of them around right. workplaces and yeah. stuff. Will that be able to survive 800 or 1,000 degrees C, that plastic break glass? No. What about the plastic back of the metal bell? Will that be able to withstand 800 degrees C? No. So the room that's on fire, everything melts and falls off the wall. The glands themselves, so this is a made up gland and you saw it on the video, they can only go to about 105 degrees C during operation. So in other words, we know thermoplastic and thermosetting was 70 and 90 degrees. We did that in previous videos in lessons. So these ends can get up to about 105. But the PVC sheath on the outside, it's about 80. OK, so and it's only got a little plastic clap, cap in there. And we saw that in my other video when I made it off. Plastic cap. Well, that plastic cap's going to melt when this is on fire. So people get sort of confused and think, You've got a flame retardant system. You haven't. You've got a plastic break glass. You've got plastic back to the bell. These have got plastic caps in them in this style of end. Therefore, if the room in which is on fire, the stuff inside it just gives up. We're worried about the rooms that aren't on fire. So I always say if we're sitting in classroom A, the one we would have sat in, and there was a fire in our room, we'd know that it was on fire by the raging heat and choking of gases and our panicking people within it. Six classrooms down doesn't know it's on fire and the wiring system maybe for the alarms that we're talking about that goes through the room that's on fire needs to stay energized for the longest amount of time hence the cable itself is flame retardant or fire resistive in the area that's on fire but we're not installing ends that are flame resistant you can get them and what ends up happening you know the soft compound that i showed pushing in on the video that i did on making the end off you end up having something very similar to like a bitumen pour so you end up pouring it into a completely different gland if you want a flame retardant gland or one that can withstand greater temperatures does that make sense yeah yeah so that's a, a little bit of a popular misconception people think you know the other end this is fire resistant it isn't you know plastic cap bit of old compound in there on a, on a plastic break glass it's the it's the cables going through the room on fire that can survive that fire it was introduced in about 1937 why do you think we were looking for a flame retardant or fire resistive cable in about 1937 uh, lots of coal and heat industry 
It may be, yeah. What other things were happening in that era around 1937? Uh, war. Yeah, well, we, we generally had a little bit of disagreements with people in Europe, uh, yeah. unsimilar to the ones we've had recently, uh, obviously, with them. But yeah, so there's there was, there was a, a real need for a cable that could withstand fire. OK, so hence the introduction of mineral insulated copper covered cables. OK, so that's got you up to speed with that one. So what we're going to look at next. Let's look at the the we've looked at the overview of the cables, constructions of them and the, the sheaths. What I'm going to do is I'll stop this video and then we'll have a look at the tools that we're going to need in order to make the ends off uh, next. And then we'll just fly through our notes. So for those people who have been watching these series of videos, just to reiterate, we're doing this for a laugh on a, on a Sunday afternoon. As you can see, a couple of people only have joined us. We've got two or three more lessons left. We thank you for watching our videos, but we are doing it all out of the goodness of our own heart.